Welcome to Perspectives on Energy and Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the grid operator certification exam and how it is getting tougher. NERC is changing their exam questions again. We'll find out more about NERC from our guest for the show is Guillermo Sabatier, who is with Industrial Skills of HSI. Welcome to the show, Guillermo. Uh, Jay, thank you so much for having me today again. It's always fun to be back. So tell us about this exam. You know, I mean, I'm, exams terrify me. I went through so many years of school and exams and blue books and what have you um, that I, I, I worry for people who have to take exams. Um, I know how stressful it is. So tell us about this exam and why it exists in the first place. Of course, of course. So this exam really is is a end result of many different catastrophes in a way. Um, what it is, is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, NERC, is a, is a, a governing body made up by the industry, uh, electric utilities. And what it is really, it's a way to qualify initial qualification for grid operators or system operators uh, to be able to, like, to to be able to operate the system. Now, mind you, that that's the first step. They have to do all kinds of internal training and have other certifications beyond that. But th this is your entry right into the industry and to prove you can do this. And th this all arose uh, really like the, the exam was around since um, uh, for, for decades. But this exam really became interesting right after the 2003 blackout that we had in the Northeast. Once that happened, that exam got a lot more challenging initially. And then and then now, uh, over the years, it's gotten more challenging still. So in the past, there used to be an exam that was only taken once every three years because it was pretty simple, right? But now you take it one time, and then you basically renew your certification with continuing education hours. But this is a tough exam. Uh, it's not quite the way it used to before. So, But... Again, it's it's basically proving that you know how to you know the, the grid basics and the grid concepts. And that give me an example of a question or a scenario that you're you're asked to um, comment on. Of course, uh, for example, they'll ask they they have some easy questions. They had they got some more difficult questions. And one of the examples that they have, for example, is say, hey, what do you do when you have your voltage is beginning to to decay? in the middle of the afternoon, do you A, put in more re reactor or reactive resources like capacitor banks? Do you shed load? Do you uh, put more generation on? And usually that, that question is rather simple. The first thing you would say is, yes, I will put more capacitor banks in service to support voltage. And that's usually a, a slightly easier situation question and with some recall. But now the, the problems have gotten a lot more where they have a diagram. And in the presentation on slide, say, 13, the, the, there's a diagram of what two different two different like uh, stations look like. And they'll say, with an overload on this line and this configuration and this sort of like uh, dispatch, how do you alleviate this particular like, like uh, overload and this transformer between these two stations? And then the, you really have to know a lot more of the grid grid dynamics to be able to figure that problem out. So, and that's something that I never saw when I took the exam back in 2005. For, you know, that, that was really the last time I took it. Now the exams are way more challenging, but hmm. a lot more applied questions is what they are. So is it subjective, objective? Is it uh, a blue book exam when you're writing a blue book or is it online? Is there one right answer and one wrong answer? Yeah. Uh, or are there many answers? So here, here's a challenge, right? Most uh, all those questions are multiple choice, and those questions have all been uh, conjured up by the by NERC through one of the committees, which is the um, the committee that determines the exam, right? It, it's the exam working group. So these working groups are made up of like industry peers, right? And they and they come up with these questions. So out of these questions, the exam usually has a, is 120 questions or 100 questions. Some of them have like 20, 25 questions that are pilot questions. They're not, they don't really count, but you don't know which one of those, those are, are are the pilot questions. So they, they're testing those for a future version of the exam. But yeah, that, that exam is graded. There is one right answer per, per, per question, and that's all graded automatically. Uh, you normally take it at a, at a test center. And those test centers basically are, you go in there, sit down, take your exam. You have two and a half hours to do 120 questions. And as, as soon as you're done, you submit it, you know immediately if you passed or failed. It takes some of the heat off it. So we, right. it's graded It's graded uh, electronically then. It's graded automatically, multiple choice. 
And uh, the machine will know exactly how you did right away. Hmm? Right, right, right. And, yes. and it's it's an interesting thing because um, it's gotten pretty challenging. And, and really what they test you on is these operating standards. And there's, God, these there's so many standards. And there's over 400 some odd requirements. You need to know most of those. Um, but in reality, they've gotten away from just route memorization and you have more of an applied type of response, which really you're looking at, at more of the science rather than, you know, you still have to know a little bit of the rules, right? Where certain things have certain rules and operating the grid. But it is rather interesting. Um, I have like a, a table, a slide eight, that shows exam statistics. And uh, back in 2004, 2005, the pass rate was 83%. Then it would be beginning to drop down to like 70%. And then it got as low as 62% in 2008, which is when they first made a change to this to the exam format. Uh, they became more of an applied thing and less of a, a recalling memorized figures thing. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, it, 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 it was pretty low and it got better because people got better at studying. Uh, HSI, for example, offers uh, an exam test prep program where you're basically taught everything about the exam, not just the exam, you're taught about the topics that the exam covers, and then you take some practice tests, but really what you're doing is, is learning the concepts so you can better answer these questions. Not everybody has to take that uh, prep prep course. Not everybody you, does because it you're is... You're better advised if you do take it, though. You're better advised. There is a cost, of course, you know, it's a couple of thousand bucks, but it, it, it is definitely helpful because that pass rate, I mean, when we looked at 2020, the exam pass rate was only 60%. 2021 was 59%, That and that was a pass rate. Now, people that go through our program end up doing a lot better. The pass rate's about in, in the 80s, mid-80s somewhere. So that, that's an example of how uh, here on, on this exam statistic, basically it, it's the raw number where people don't take our, our, our training. So that is a pretty good, I guess, metric. And in, in, if you get help versus not getting help, just go in there, st study the standards cold and try and pass, which is not, not always a good idea. I mean, also the exam is like, uh, to actually register for the exam, it's $800. Whoa, it's wow. It's an expensive exam, right? Yeah. So who's this exam for? I mean, uh, what what kind? Who who takes this exam, and and how does it benefit them to mm -hmm. take the exam, and how does it uh, act to their detriment if they don't do well? It's a really really important question, actually, because to be a grid operator, especially somebody that's touching, uh, basically, you know, your 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 you're taking actions that impact the uh, the condition of the, of the grid, right? You're operating devices, changing settings, moving voltage around. Most people are the ones that have to be certified with this exam. And you cannot touch anything out there. You can't put your fingers on a keyboard to operate anything until you're certified. And, and really, it's not, not just certification. It usually requires an internal sort of like a qualification that's, that's, that's independent to each, that's usually uh, unique to each company. So the certification is your very initial like license to operate. And then knowing how to operate your own system is yet another layer that each company has. Uh, basically, you cannot operate the system unless you're certified, and that's usually a a condition of employment in in these jobs. Now, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, Corporation Merck. That's not a government agency. What is that? A, an agency, by extension, through the uh, through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Federal Federal uh, FERC. That that's a federal agency. And that FERC is acting as an agent of the Department of Energy. So they, FERC sets all the rules on how you want the grid operated. So FERC has now said, all right, tells the industry itself, here you go. You guys come up with the rules to follow my, my, my mandate. So the industry itself has to figure out how to do it. But they're allowed, you know, through NERC, because it is made up of the actual, of the actual like, uh, stake, key stakeholders in the industry. But that's not to say that... Um, NERC itself also conducts audits to make sure that you're following the rules of all these standards that you're tested on. And, and, and some of those standards involved personnel training. Uh, there's a personnel training standards that are very, and, and violation of those rules can be as severe as $1 million per infraction per day. So if you do something wrong for long enough, you could be out of business in, in some of these smaller utilities. If I take the exam, I I I need the job, right? I need to, and and uh, my utility company employer or my my contractor 
tells me, Jay, you, you got to take this exam if you want the job. Um, and I go take the I take the the training course. I, mm -hmm. I I I put the money down for the the exam itself. I take the exam, and I flunk it. What happens? No job. Can I take it again and again and again? So the requirement for the exam, and, and that's where I say being how being in Hawaii, you're lucky because the the exam is not required there, and NERC really has no jurisdiction in Hawaii. But in the mainland, parts of parts of uh, Mexico and Canada. Uh, NERC definitely has jurisdiction. So working in any 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 um, any uh, utility that has a certain voltage and above, they are definitely required to have that. Now, if you want to have that job as an operator, um, especially if you have a, if you're in a utility that just now qualifies, for example, to 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 fall under NERC jurisdiction, then usually they're going to have their operators get certified. In most cases, I've seen them. I've seen most operators take the exam two. I've seen operators take the exam two or three times until they finally pass. But some places are more lenient than others. I've seen some of them give them as many as four or five chances. I've seen others where they, you know, they cut it off at three, and then they, you know, this is not a good fit for you anymore. Go find work somewhere else. But or and w usually they'll, they'll find placement for them in the company somewhere. So if you want to be a grid operator, you you got to pass the exam, and the exam until you pass it, unless you pass right. it in accordance with whatever your right, employer right. or your prospective employer wants from you, you don't you don't get that job. Uh, right. So what is the job of a grid operator? So let's okay. assume I get certification. Let's assume I keep it current, um, and now I'm a grid operator. Uh, what does it mean to be a grid operator? What kind of a job is that? And how much does it pay? And right. does it pay? Does it is the pay based in part on how I how I did on the exam? Well, the the usually the exam is the first step. The the, the exam says, hey, okay, you know you know how to drive, but you don't know how to drive this specific truck. Let's not get you specific uh, specific training on a specific truck. You know all the basics, great. Now let's teach you how to drive this truck, and and that's the example right there. And then so every utility is going to have more specialized training to then qualify you to then operate your specific system. So what do they do? Uh, op uh, grid operators normally are basically, they're checking forecasts for like load versus generation. They're looking at uh, maintaining grid reliability. They're looking at, for example, uh, maintaining voltage. So the key number one job for a grid operators to make sure we don't black out, but basically it's so to make sure that the grid is reliable, safe, and also, uh, um, economical, and then of course, compliant. And, and, and the compliance has, it, it, it can have environmental requirements. It can have, for example, reliability requirements. It can have state uh, regulatory requirements. But for the, but really what it is, is that they're driving, think of it as they're, they're driving a plane and, or, or they're flying a plane. And it's almost like being FAA certified. Well, you need to have that and training to be able to fly this thing safely, effectively, efficiently, and, and reliably. Same way. So what what do they make? So I've seen some operators make uh, they start starting off in the in the high five figures and all the way into like well into like the uh, between one fifty and one eighty in some cases maybe a little more depending on what part of the country. So they they do very well, and they only work forty hours a week, which is another interesting thing. They tend to work shift, meaning you're working days, sometimes working nights. So it's not really a forty hour a week job, or only from from seven a.m. to three p.m. You have sometimes rotating shifts. So if you can handle shift work, uh, that's great because you don't take any work home, right? Once you're once you walk out those doors, you're done until the next day. So that's the other uh, uh, that that's the other thing that that attracts a, a lot of operators, right, to that sort of job where it's like you know working shift work for some people. I mean, I did that job for a while and I really enjoyed it, but it becomes more difficult when you have different family obligations, right, as you can imagine. This reminds me of um, this reminds me of the Merchant Marine. I, yep. I had a friend who was uh, I was in the Coast Guard with him. And he got out of the Coast Guard and, and he got a job as a, a ship's master. He passed the test uh, and he was qualified as a master. And all of a sudden, you know, from military pay, which wasn't very much at the time, uh, he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year yeah. as the master of of these ships, these merchant marine ships. And he was only working six months a year. Oh, yeah. That's it. And it was the sweetest job in the world. And he was young yet. And I, you know, I wonder if this is that that kind of job. In other words, I'm out of college. Um, I did engineering, um, mm -hmm. but I haven't had a lot of uh, 
you know, experience in the utility industry. And yet I'm fully capable of taking the test, passing the test. And I guess pass or fail is, is what we're talking right. about. Maybe right. Right. if there's a grade, I'd like to know about it. But so he, I passed the test and I'm 24 years old. I'm just picking uh -huh. that number. And now if, if this is dependent on my ability to pass the test, I go to a utility company without experience but with a, you know, the test, and certification. And with a certification, and I get on there for 150. Um, is, does that happen? Is this the kind of a job that you would you would want to plan your career around as a young person? I, I you, you probably wouldn't start off at 150, but you definitely can can get close to six figures uh, just 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 out of college with certification. I, I've seen it, right? And, and I see them getting into the 70s, 80s, 90s. But they get out there pretty soon. I mean, after three or four or five years, right, what you learn on the job, granted, they have a lot of, they have over 200 hours over three years of continuing education requirements. So you're getting a lot of training just to maintain a certification. So these companies, even though they're giving you required training, they decide what kind of training to give you. So they're really giving you, you, you can maximize your knowledge. And become very, very, I mean, for me, I, I, I'm really the product of that. And I really greatly benefited from the training I got with my old organization. They, I mean, I've learned a lot and it's been so valuable in my career, right? So for them, they can do very well. And then in a lot of these places, they're working shift work, which means they're getting overtime, whether it's straight time or it's time and a half or double time and a half. And in some of places, they're even unionized by the uh, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, the IBEW. So they're... They got their own special overtime rules and they can do very well if they have to fill like an open shift, for example. And if you have enough of a shortage, you can do very well. You know, looking back down the trail, um, you know, since you took the test, what, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, uh, the utilities have changed. Um, electrical yes. power has changed. You said there was a Northeast black blackout in, was it 2003? 2003. <laughs> um, I remember, I think Spencer Abram was the Secretary of Energy at the time. And I remember a fantastic thing he said. He said, you guys think that because you put infrastructure on the ground, because you build a grid, it'll last forever. Then when you have a blackout across the Northeast and there is no power for you know huge numbers of people, um, that, that, the, that the grid failed um, because it should have lasted longer. But no, you have to renew the grid you have mm -hmm. to make it better all the time. I never forget that. And I was I very much appreciated that he said that. Um, in any event, it seems to me that there's a dynamic here and that mm -hmm. there's this technology, there are organizational issues, there are scientific issues, who knows what. And so yeah. part of the changes in this FERC exam have to be based on changes in the technology, in the industry, you know, in, in the community, if you will. Absolutely. Um, and so uh, I guess my question is, um, you know, um, it should be high pay right. and it should be automated. You know, for example, the things they asked you on your test back 20 years ago um, may be automated now. Um, for example, I would assume that when you go in to take this test these days, you can bring a calculator with you. But more than that, when you go to the job, you have not only calculators, but you have a a million consoles around you. Ooh, right. You can ask them any question and get an answer and have them do the calculation. So it isn't like it was. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. But in the exam, believe it or not, you cannot use calculators. So, ah. so they, you got to do quick math in your head, which is which is another thing, right? You you they're they're not very very deeply math intensive, but you do have very simple like. Uh, a little bit of trig, you have a little bit of Pythagorean theorems, but you have the typical, you know, three, four, five triangle sort of thing where when it comes to that basic trigonometry, but trigonometry is in there. Uh, so so it's not a simple exam in math. And you, you have a couple of squares or square roots. You got to do a little bit of algebra, right? Uh, you have a, a, an equation to calculate, for example, uh, area control error. So that's another thing. You look at frequency. So there is a little bit of math, but yeah, you're not allowed to use uh, calculators on the exam, which I thought is really interesting. But uh, no, definitely a, a challenge in that regard. So, you know, you mentioned, and this is very troubling to me, that uh, not every state, not every mm, area of power production uh, requires this exam of the grid operators. 
And Hawaii is one of those areas right. it doesn't okay. require That's a reason why. the exam. What? Well, why not? Is is isn't that asking for trouble? If you have any one of your islands has a disturbance and it blacks out, do you black out the other islands? And that's the challenge. So for us here, since we're all interconnected, we have the eastern interconnection, you have ERCOT in Texas, and you have the west the western interconnection. The problem they're trying to avoid is having one particular entity cause a disturbance so bad that you begin to black out not just yourself, but everybody else around you. So that is one of the main drivers of this certification to make sure everybody who's who's flying these ships, in other words, know what they're doing and, and they avoid like a reliability issue. In Hawaii, for example, uh, if you really like do something wrong, you're gonna ice, you're gonna limit or you're gonna isolate that problem to just one of the islands. You're not gonna black out the rest of the islands. Um, but but then again, you have a blacked out island, which is you know to, to me it's it's always been a point of contention was like why aren't they certifying people? But then again, you know it's it's uh, I know that that the Hawaiian Public Service Commission and, and I guess Hiko they have their own qualifications for for operators in Hawaii. And that's unique to the island, right? To to to, to Hiko or to the uh, the entities there, but they're not NERC certifications. No, that that the Hawaii, for example, I'm sure Hiko and all the other entities have their own qualifications, and I'm sure they're they're strict and they're tough, but they 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 are required to have NERC certifications. But I catch is that this is mostly about reliability and avoiding blackouts and all that. But it is yeah. if you balance it right. And if you use all the lessons and all the, you know, grid scenario procedures that are involved in the test and, uh, you know, in, in, in the challenges of the test, um, you will have, may I say, cheaper energy for the consumer because it's more efficient that way. Am I right? Well, there's definitely an aspect where, where it's like operating it correctly. You know, one of the key drivers in you operating your grid has to do with the area control error. And that area control error has an impact on, uh, on what your cost per megawatt is, your, your production cost. So ultimately, you know, you want to keep your production cost as low as possible, right? When, when you're running a grid, specifically you when you're running the, the 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 generation side. When you're doing transmission, meaning you're operating the actual wires is a different story, but that also impacts cost as well, right? Especially when you're when you when you when you impact the way they can move power from one place to another, that also has 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 its, its impact on costs. So, yeah, there there always is a monetary component with all this, and they can really impact it in a good way or in a negative way, depending on how well they operate. Yeah, let me uh, let me offer a, a thought here, and that mm -hmm. is that you know um, over those twenty years and going forward twenty years, there'll be more and more automation. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, you could go through the test and the standards from NERC right now, and you could say, hmm, this could be automated, that could oh, be automated. Yeah. Why don't we just get some programmers in here and program software to do all of that for the grid operator? On the other hand, I also see the need to have the grid operator trained now mm -hmm. and in the future so he or she can look at the screen and tell when that software isn't working properly, mm -hmm. when something is wrong, where the standards are not being maintained by the automated system. And so it's not like you could say, eh, we don't care about that anymore. It's all automated now. So he doesn't have to learn that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I, it seems to me that he has to learn it in order to make sure the machine is doing the right thing. Am I right? No, absolutely. And, and, and there's always a, that that whole black box syndrome, right? Where where it's like, hey, the the box has an input and an output. I don't know what it does inside, but I know what I'm supposed to get, and I know what I put into it. And that's about it. So problem is, you don't know what's going on inside. Uh, so so here, uh, let me give you an example of something that became so automated that now they've eliminated standards. There used to be these uh, these standards called the interchange standards, and they basically govern the way we get buy and sell power between utilities and i'm talking about wholesale power uh, the deals right where you're moving 100 megawatts between utility a and utility b and you got to do it on these lines you got to reserve space in the lines it's almost like shipping power like, like like scheduling a shipping container full of goods putting it on a truck picking which highway to put it in and, and get it from the factory to the consumer right away but and you got to schedule that every hour on the hour or maybe schedule it you know a day ahead or sort of thing so and a lot of that followed a bunch of rules.
But now the software has gotten so, so great that pretty much everybody uses the same software. So NERC after a while says, well, if you are using the software, I mean, these standards, the, the software has been built to already comply with these standards. So there's no point in, in you know, and even bothering with, uh, with auditing these, these standards. They're, they're still there, but most of them have been retired. And that's an example of what happens there, right? Where, where it is, to, and, and you, you see that these buy and sell power from each other all the time. Specifically, when you have an area that has a lot of renewable resources, way in the middle of the desert over there, east of California or north of California, you have all that hydro, that power has to be brought in somehow. Well, all of that is scheduled. They have to reserve the space on, on the transmission lines. They have to schedule the power. Okay, at this hour, I'm going to turn on and I'm going to stay on for the next you know, uh, 16 hours. And then at the end of that period, I'm going to I'm going to shut that off and and, ramp, and basically just end the schedule. And that goes on day after day. So that's an example of how things are scheduled in and out. But uh, as far as automation goes, there one of the things that were went wrong was during that Northeast blackout of 2003, they had um, they tried to do some automation, and the problem was that that it wasn't as developed, and these operators were getting alarms, right? But they, they weren't seeing them. So when they looked at, at, their, at their page, they had two or three alarms, and to them everything seemed fine on their page all their neighbors around them saying, hey, what is going on with you guys? It looks like your your world is on fire. And they all saw what was happening, but this guy says, nope. And they kept looking at their own screen. Nope, my, I got no alarms, I'm fine. But in reality, things were really like decaying horribly until finally they reset their systems and they realized that their alarm processor was not working and they had pages and pages of alarms and by then it was too late. So they've improved a lot of the automation they had since then. And right now we have a lot of things that are automated and the tools are greatly improved. We're greatly improved. I mean, as to where we were 15, 20 years ago, but, but uh, as an operator now, our things are a little bit different where it's like the interfaces are different. The dashboards are way different. Uh, the, 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 the human machine uh, interfaces has, has evolved a great deal to the point that your job is more efficient now, but you still have to get like a pretty good big picture. The granularity of things that you're doing are that's mostly automated. But the big picture strategic approach is really where the operators is, is, is doing most of their work now. So you took the exam, you've um, upgraded, you know, your knowledge of these uh, standards and the like uh, over all these years. And, you know, I asked at the outset, uh, what, what does it mean to the public? Well, I guess to the public, it means, um, you know, they can have more reliable energy. They can have energy that's transferred from grid to grid. Um, they can have hopefully cheaper energy, at least in some places. But what does it mean to you, uh, Guillermo? What does it mean to HSI? Um, do you do you sit at that table with the grid operator? Do you supervise the grid operator? Do you have to know more or less than the grid operator? What what does the test mean to you? Well, for us, really, it is it is uh, we get to help a lot of these like new candidates prepare for the exam. That's one example. So a, a lot of us go take the exam regularly and, and, and we kind of see what the exam looks like. And then we prepare training material to prepare them for the exam. Right. Um, and in a lot of cases, right, like we're not part of the exam, the, uh, the, the question, the, uh, the exam uh, drafting team, but we get to see what they're, what all the exam test, what well, the test takers are experiencing. Right. So we, we get to modify our training material to, to better help them. But me, I, I was also an, an operator, so I can definitely tell you that that um, I get to give them the benefit of like this is how the grid works. If you know the principles, it won't matter what question they throw at you; you'll be able to answer it. And the worst thing they can do is try and memorize questions because there you, you just you don't really understand the concept. But if you have the the all the principles you know buttoned down, it won't matter what they ask you; you'll be able to figure it out. It sounds like the bar cram course. You know, you finish law school. Now you have to take a course that prepares you to take the bar exam. Yep. It's the same thing. Very similar. And oh, it's yeah. dressed, it, it addresses the, uh, you know, the exam and how you should uh, look at the exam. I asked at the beginning whether I should take the exam. And based on this discussion, Guillermo, I have no intention of taking <laughs> the exam. I want to be clear about that. But... But I also think that if some young engineering student came to me and said, you know, should I be a grid operator? Um, should I learn about the NERC exam? Should I take the exam? Um, should, I take a, should I take a preparatory course to learn about how to take the exam? I would tell them absolutely. Oh, yeah. um, and it seems to me from this discussion that that would be good advice. Do you agree? 
Oh, absolutely agree. Especially as they're getting into this industry and they, and they want to work in the control center. Uh, a grid control center is definitely, I mean, first of all, if you want to work in this required anyway, but so, so if they want to take that exam and certify, the problem is that it wasn't like it used to. I mean, right now you take the exam, it's the intention is you're going to, get, you're going to work the job and you're going to get continuing education hours. If you take the exam and you don't really get continuing education hours, it's almost like a wasted effort. So that's the other challenge there. I, I mean, I mean, you're, if you're going to take it, but not work in the industry, you get, you're going to then have to invest in 200 hours over three years of continuing education. But if you take the exam and you're like, hey, now I qualify for these jobs, I'm going to, I'm going to go apply. It's a good chance you're going to get hired. And then at that point, usually any organization that requires you to be certified is also going to provide the training for you anyway. So thank you so much, Guillermo. Guillermo Sabache from HSI, helping us understand the inner workings and hidden mechanisms of how you get qualified uh, for the NERC exam. Thank you so much. No, well, thank you. And it's always fun talking about this. And if, if any of you watching the video have a question, feel free to put it in the comments. I'll, I'll do my best to get back and respond and get you the right answer. Great. Thank you, Guillermo. Aloha. Thank you.